Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Molly Felton and I'm the online education specialist here at APIC. The Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology is pleased to present this webinar in partnership with the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Today's session is titled IPC Strategies to Reduce the Risk for Monkeypox Outbreaks. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items for our participants. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be available within 48 hours. We will notify all attendees once it is available. The content of this presentation is confidential and intended for attendees only. Please do not share any images or content from the PowerPoint slides. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. If you need technical assistance, please send us a message in the chat box or send an email to elearning at apic.org. And now it is my pleasure to introduce APIC CEO, Devin Jopp. Devin, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Molly. And it's a pleasure to have all of you here joining us today. Uh, we know you all are crazy busy. And of course, now we have monkeypox to contend with. Uh, working uh, with our partners over in Shea, uh, we wanted to bring this timely session together around really around how to look at reducing the risk for monkeypox uh, outbreaks. And so again, uh, thank you to our colleagues over in Shea, and I'll turn to them in a second. I do wanna just quickly introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have Jill Holdsworth, who's a manager of infection prevention department with the Emory University of Hospital Midtown and also an APIC board of directors. And also Supriya Narasimhan, who is chief of infectious diseases in, at division at the hospital epidemiologist at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. So welcome today to our speakers. And before we kick this off, I'd like to turn this over to my good friend, uh, Executive Director of Frische, Christy Weinshell. So Christy, welcome. Thanks, Devin. And thanks all of you for taking the time today to join. We would like to uh, start today's webinar with the poll that just sort of popped up on your screen and to get a sense of who the audience is. This webinar on monkeypox and IPC is a critical topic for APIC and SHEA members, and we are so pleased to have today's presenters share their expertise as part of our ongoing partnership with APIC. I'd now like to invite Jill to get us started. Hi, everybody, and welcome. And as soon as those polls finish up, we will let you know what those questions are. So please go ahead and, and finish up answering the polls and we'll get started and let you know how those ended up. We'll give you just a few more seconds here. All right, and I see our answers here in the chat. So, and I know some of you are answering in the chat, but let's go ahead and, and see what the, the results are here from the actual poll question. So it looks like um, a lot of, of folks aren't seeing many monkeypox cases. Um, I like that some, some people are seeing too numerous to count. You're seeing a lot of them already. So what is your current role? We got a lot of IPs on the line, several nurses, several EPIs, um, lots of uh, physicians and public health professionals. <clears throat> Looking at our geographic locations, kind of a, a little bit of a spread all over the U.S. That's great. And uh, looking at the primary um, places of, of practice. We've got a lot of academic medical centers. Um, we got 42% from the community hospitals, 4% um, from long-term care, 3% private practice. And interesting, we have 18% from um, chose other. So uh, very interesting. So thank you everybody for joining us. We're really excited to be presenting this information to you today. Again, my name is Jill Holdsworth. I'm the manager of infection prevention at Emory University Hospital Midtown, and I'll be going over a very broad 
a view of just some general infection prevention practices related to monkeypox. And then my co-presenter, Sapria, will be going over um, another view of monkeypox from the physician side. So I do have no disclosures to report. And just giving you a general uh, overview of monkeypox in recent history, I find this interesting, just kind of looking before all of this started, we didn't hear about it as, as often as, as we are now. So just kind of looking at where we were seeing it when we saw the first human case back in, in 1970. And then we saw some general cases here and there um, back in 2003, all the way to 2021. We saw kind of a variety of cases here and there. So not, not too many to worry about, but going to this year, here's kind of that order of what happened this year and bringing us to where we are today. So we, we saw that kind of first person going from London, traveling to Nigeria, and then moving forward to May of this year, we started seeing those cases happening in the United States. And then fast forwarding to yesterday, I pulled these numbers from the CDC website and you can find wherever your state is. If you haven't looked at these numbers recently, I encourage you to get on the CDC website and just kind of see where you are every now and then. But if you find your state, you can see where you are and see how your cases are doing. So some cases obviously are higher in some states than others. And I did also pull some of the states that are seeing higher numbers. So you can see California, New York, Florida are seeing higher case numbers um, than some of the other states. And again, this is as of yesterday. All right, so diving right in, as always, we're going to continue to say, identify, isolate, and inform. That's what we always want to really focus on when we're talking about infection prevention with any type of infectious disease. And my co-presenter is going to talk a lot more about the identify portion of this and really what are we looking for with that vesicular pustular rash? She's gonna show a lot of uh, different examples of what that's going to look like. One of the things that we want to really uh, stress is if you're looking at a patient that might have unexplained pharyngitis or proctitis to really think about what are their risk factors and could we have exposures if we don't consider these patients as well. And especially if you have a hospital that is doing a lot of scoping um, or doing trachs, things like that. And how are you managing those patients if you have urgent airway issues or ENT cases? And that's something to really consider how are you being extra careful with those patients? So really think about um, how you're doing that identify portion with patients that maybe don't have lesions yet or don't have a rash yet. And we'll talk more about the identify later in the program. I'm gonna talk a lot about the isolate portion. Where are we putting the patients, putting them in a private room, how we're covering those lesions, how we're doing the PPE. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about the inform. Who are we informing? How are we talking? to the providers, who are we talking to, and how are we informing everybody once we, we know that they have monkeypox or that they're um, a PUI for monkeypox. So let's first talk about that isolate portion and how is this transmitted? We know that we are talking about um, direct or indirect contact, that skin to skin contact, um, and they are infectious until not just the crusting of the skin lesions, but there's that new skin growth that's coming up after those lesions have crusted over and there's new skin growth coming um, up underneath those crusted lesions. The PPE, I hope we know this by now, but we wanna do that, the standard precautions, gown, N95 and eye protection. So very important that we have on the, the correct PPE. And this can be hard sometimes, like I mentioned with those airway emergencies. So making sure that we have available PPE where we need it and at all times. So making sure also that the patient, make sure we have a mask on that patient, make sure they're in a private room with the door closed and make sure that we can cover those lesions whenever possible and that we're limiting movement in and out of the room. No special air handling is required unless we're doing an aerosolizing procedure. So however you're gonna handle that is, is fine, but just knowing that we don't have to have the special air handling unless we're doing an aerosolized procedure. And then making sure that we have proper signage. And I know in the beginning, you may not have known what sign to use. You may not have had a special sign for 
monkeypox specific, but I was able to collect some of the signs that are being used around the country. And thank you for those who allowed me to use their signs. These are just a few of the signs that are being used around the country for monkeypox. A lot of people did tell me that they were using their COVID signs and they just um, made them look a little bit differently so that they were more uh, visible as monkeypox or they just reused their COVID signs so that everybody knew that it was the same type of PPE. However, it is easiest for everyone to know this is what PPE is safe and that's gonna keep the employees safe from going in. That's what we need to use for these patients. So again, with transmission, with proper isolation, skin-to-skin -skin contact, you can get um, that transmission with skin to mucus or respiratory droplets. Um, and again, that duration of isolation is really in, important to understand. And then that inform portion. So making sure that you have a process for informing all providers. That includes your first responders. So if this person did come through um, the emergency room and they came by ambulance or they came by some sort of transport, how are you making sure that you have that communication back? Any kind of personnel who are supervising that unit, anyone that is taking care of the, the patient on that unit, infection prevention, public health, make sure that you cover all of your basis for informing all of those who need to be informed. And talking about environmental concerns, there are so many things that we could talk about around environmental. So I wanna talk about linen first. And linen does not just mean bed sheets. It also means towels. It also means clothing. So the one thing that is very specific on the CDC website is you don't wanna shake or handle in a way that disperses infectious material. So you don't wanna be flapping the sheets around. You don't wanna be throwing the towels around the room. So handling the linen very carefully, containing it in a linen bag as soon as possible and avoiding contact with the lesion material in the linen, making sure you're still wearing PPE when you are handling the linen in the room and cleaning the room. So this also may, makes you want to make sure that your EVS personnel are comfortable trained with PPE, wearing the PPE correctly, so that when they are cleaning the room, that they are doing so in a safe manner and that they know all of these things as well. And the waste handling, this has, has changed a little bit as we've been going through this over the last few months and how we're able to treat the waste. So I, I put it here as it says on the CDC website, but I really encourage you to make sure that you're working with your local health departments to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So when you're talking about regulated medical waste, meaning the same as other potentially infectious materials that you use for isolation and other things, then the clade two is how we are treating all, all of the same things with other regulated medical waste. If you have reason to believe that you have a monkeypox case that could be clade one, then we must treat that as category A. And I've included the link here for the DOT website where you can find more information on what that means and how you would need to treat that type of waste. And again, this is best done in collaboration with your local health department and how you would treat that, how you would dispose of that, and also in collaboration with your environmental services personnel. And just some more environmental concerns, looking at disinfection. What do we use? What is okay to use as far as disinfection goes? And hopefully you guys have already looked into this, but just in case you haven't, you can go onto the EPA list queue, which I've also put the link here to, and make sure that what you're using is on the emerging viral pathogens claim list and on that list queue. So you wanna go make sure that you're using something that is on that list, and then of course, following the manufacturer's instructions for use. And as always, make sure that you're using something that is going to be easy to use and easy to be compliant for use. And of course you want to avoid things like dry dusting, sweeping, vacuuming, using wet methods of cleaning is always going to be better for things like this. So just making sure that again, you're partnering with your environmental services team to make sure you're doing things that are easy, compliant, and as low risk as possible, but really working with them um, in partnership is what has, has worked best for 
a lot of people that I've talked to because everybody's nervous. Everybody was a little scared in the beginning just to clean these rooms and really helping people understand how to do this safely and really emphasizing that PPE works and that we can do this together and we can all be safe. That's what's really important. And this link at the bottom of this slide that you can also reference is that guidelines for environmental infection control and healthcare facilities from the CDC. And this has a lot of great information in it if you have not referenced this before. And, um, and it has a lot of things for pathogens. Okay, and moving on this, if you have not referenced this before, this is on the APIC website. This is specifically for um, monkeypox education. These are just a couple of the pictures from this reference and this link takes you right to it. And this is a great resource that you can print out for various staff members, community. Um, I have found this is a great reference for all sorts of, of different types of education and different people. And uh, we, we've used it here just to give to people who want some general information. I've posted it on social media for people to reference. Um, so this is a great resource if you have not referenced it before. And I've also included a couple other uh, references that, uh, and you can just scan the QR code and it'll take you right there. Um, the CDC website for monkeypox and NETEC, which is one of our training centers that has a lot of monkeypox resources, webinars, and podcasts that you can also reference um, for lots of training materials and educational materials. And that is the end of my slide deck. And I just wanted to uh, give a, a shout out to our ID and IP teams um, who have been doing a lot of great work with, with monkeypox and with vaccinations. So with that, I am going to send it over to Supriya. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, it is such a pleasure to be invited by Shay and by APEC to co-speak co on this talk with Jill. Um, I'm just getting ready to share my screen. Give me a moment. Okay. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, you know, I'm Supriya Narsimhan. Um, I'm the Chief of Infectious Diseases and the Hospital Epidemiologist at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. My academic affiliation is with Stanford, and I have no financial disclosures to report during this talk. So the topics that I was asked to cover in this talk are the clinical manifestations and the diagnostic testing for monkeypox, the treatment options and the indications for treatment, clinical evaluation and the logistics of treatment. And I'm going to be focusing throughout on how to decrease the IP risk to our healthcare workers, um, occupational health and managing the exposed as well as the vaccination indications. As of August 19th, the CDPH recommended that monkeypox be renamed to MPX, pronounced as MPOX in the state of California to decrease any stigma associated with the word monkeypox. So if you see MPX in this talk, that's what I'm referring to. A little bit about where I come from. We're located in San Jose, California. We're the county hospital for the Silicon Valley Bay Area, which has a population of 1.9 million. We're quite diverse with an Asian majority followed by white and Hispanic um, residents. Um, my hospital has 574 licensed beds for both adults and pediatric uh, patients. We're a level one trauma center. We also have the, acute, the only acute psych, acute rehab and regional burn unit in the area. We have nine primary care clinics, one specialty clinic, several express cares and a homeless health program. And as of yesterday, countywide, we had had about a 148 cases of monkeypox. So moving on to the clinical manifestations of monkeypox, um, as Jill mentioned, it, it, it can have a prodrome, which uh, could be fevers, chills, and malaise, but this prodrome may be entirely absent. And the incubation period of monkeypox is about five to 21 days. Among the different symptoms that you see, including headache, backaches, chills, fever, fatigue, etc. Lymphadenopathy is deemed characteristic of this illness. The typical rash that develops with monkeypox, it develops in different parts of the body simultaneously, and it evolves together on any given part of the body. 
it can progress through four stages over two to three week time period, including macules, papules, vesicles, and pustules before it scabs over and resolves. Even if it does skip a stage or two, it is important to know that all of the all of the different lesions will evolve together, which is typical of this illness. It is said to be centrifugal, which means it starts outwards on the extremities and face and moves inwards and is typically painful. So chickenpox is more itchy, this one is more painful and the lesions can umbilicate. It is said to be contagious from the first onset of symptoms until scabs separate and there's a layer of healthy skin underneath. And these scabs are infectious. So the pictograph on the bottom of the slide, those are the classic images that the CDC had shared before. And um, it shows you vesicular, pustular, as well as umbilicated lesions of monkeypox. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but I thought this was worth repeating. A macule is a flat lesion, less than one centimeter in size that does not have any depth to it. A papule has some depth to it, it is more fleshy. A vesicle has clear fluid and a pustule has cloudy fluid. And these are examples of some of my patient's images. So on day one that one of my patients presented, he had this more vesicular looking lesion, clear fluid with a surrounding ring of erythema. On day six, they scabbed over and you can see the scabs. And on day 10, when the scabs all separated, that is when he was deemed non-infectious. So compared to the, the previous presentations we've seen in Africa where this disease is deemed endemic, the clinical presentations in the 2022 outbreak have been different. The majority have been noted in men who have sex with men, more than 97% of the cases per this New England Journal of Medicine article uh, reference below. 30 to 51% are in HIV positive individuals. The majority of them present with a rash and 70% of them or greater have anogenital lesions. So these patient images are representative. So the first two images are from the same patient who presented with penile ulcerations and balanopostitis, which is a swelling of the head of the penis and the prepuce such that it could not be retracted. It was a very painful retraction. And when we did, we found multiple umbilicated but macerated lesions of monkeypox underneath. It can also present with epididymitis and balanopostitis. The bottom two, uh, sorry, proctitis and penile and scrotal lesions. The bottom two images are, um, are from different patients. So one of the patients had a coalesced uh, perianal ulcer that had developed. And on the right-hand bottom corner, what you see is the classic perianal umbilicated lesions of monkeypox. We're also seeing some atypical presentations, including keratitis and conjunctivitis because of inoculation into the eye pharyngitis and airway edema in patients who um, have contracted this through oral sex, perilational cellulitis and secondary bacterial infections, and we have seen a case or two of self-limited myocarditis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about monkeypox clinical evaluation and treatment. Um, the first the first three key tenets of infection prevention are always to identify, isolate, and inform. And what I'm sharing with you is our EMR's best practice advisories for monkeypox. So we have built into our EPIC-based EMR some monkeypox screening questions. Um, the COVID screening is still active and the prodromal or atypical symptoms of monkeypox are already covered in the COVID screening. So we only ask two questions for monkeypox screening. We asked if a patient has been exposed to a confirmed case of monkeypox within the last three weeks. And then we ask if they have a new rash that is concerning for monkeypox. If either of these questions are answered as yes, the registration staff are immediately prompted to ensure that the patient is masked and to notify the nurse. The nursing best practice advisory prompts them to wear the appropriate PPE, which is the same as that for COVID, to immediately isolate the patient in a private room with the door closed. If a negative pressure room is made available, then it is used, but the patient is not transferred to a different location if a negative pressure room is not available. And then the medical provider is alerted immediately. The best practice advisory for the MD uh, ensures that they are also wearing the appropriate PPE. It prompts them to obtain a detailed contact and symptom history, including dates of symptom onset. We have a monkeypox tip sheet, and that is actually referenced or it's, it's able to be um, launched from this advisory. 
and it tells people how to collect samples from these lesions. And it also tells them who to contact if the patient requires admission. We have a pox on call physician and um, they can also be, uh, the amion schedule for the pox on call physician can also be accessed from EPIC. The CDC monkeypox page is also linked. So a build of this kind can really help your frontline staff in appropriately identifying and isolating these patients. For diagnostic testing of monkeypox, now it is widely available through most large commercial labs, but our testing currently goes to our county public health laboratory, and that is a two-step testing. The first step is to test for presence of non-variola orthopox virus, which in, this, in the current setting is considered diagnostic of monkeypox, and the second test is to confirm that it is indeed monkeypox. Prior to testing, we encourage everybody to follow the appropriate isolation and PPE instructions, and we recommend that the most active lesions are selected for sampling. We recommend sampling two to three lesions to increase the yield because co-infection with other STIs can occur. So sometimes we've seen patients present with syphilis and monkeypox or herpes and monkeypox, and these lesions can sometimes look confusing. And sampling multiple lesions ensures that you don't miss monkeypox. We recommend that each lesion be vigorously swabbed or brushed with two separate sterile dry polyester or Dacron swabs, and the same swab not be used for monk for multiple lesions because of the previous comment that I made that co-infection with other STIs can occur. Each swab is a set. It is transported dry without any viral transport media to our public health laboratory, and additional STI testing is recommended. The CDC is discouraging the use of sharps, so you do not have to unroof a vesicle or a pustule. You do not have to use a scalpel or a needle because that greatly increases the risk of exposure to healthcare workers without actually impacting the yield of testing. Our current turnaround time is two to three days. We use two swabs per lesion because ours is a two-step testing, and I'll come to why that's important. But Quest and other labs might have a single-step monkeypox PCR testing available. So if you're trying to um, put into place monkeypox testing for your, um, your uh, locations, there are actually detailed tip sheets that are available on the CDC, which talk you through what, what to consider and how to collect these swabs. So this is our EMR monkeypox order. We built an order uh, into our electronic medical record called uh, monkeypox virus by PCR. And whatever form is needed by the public health department is actually linked within that order itself. Doing this makes sure that the provider always fills out the form and doesn't have to look for the form in another location. Anytime this test is ordered, our electronic medical record automatically triggers a monkeypox rule-out flag, which is pictured for you, and this will prompt contact and airborne isolation. If the test result ends up being negative, the flag gets discontinued. If the test result is positive, it will switch to a monkeypox flag, and both of these are auto-discontinued in 30 days. If for any result the test is indeterminate or inconclusive, then that rule-out flag does not drop. It stays on there indicating that the patient might still be a suspect. We've actually put this into place so that um, their healthcare workers are informed and they remain safe while they're taking care of these patients. So this is what some of the results section looks like. Um, the first result we get is the non-variola orthopox PCR assay, which says it's detected. And the second confirmatory testing is the monkeypox uh, PCR, which is positive. The reason for this two-step testing um, is explained a little bit on this slide. So on September 2nd, CDC issued a lab alert, which prompted uh, clinicians and locations to the fact that a certain TNF receptor gene deletion can give you a false negative test on monkeypox RT-PCR results. This was seen in three cases in California. The TNF receptor gene is the target for the monkeypox specific RT-PCR tests, and the molecular lab developed tests that are specific for monkeypox virus and target this gene. If this gene is mutated, they did not detect the virus and gave you a false negative. However, these cases were detected by the non-variola orthopox virus test. 
So to prevent false negatives, if your lab uses a monkeypox virus specific lab developed tests and that test result comes back negative, then please refer highly suspicious virus specimens to your public health laboratory or to the CDC to confirm results. You can also sidestep this by using a multiplex assay that targets multiple viral genes or other genes that are unlikely to mutate or use a test that also detects non-variolar orthopox virus. For this reason, we are continuing to use our two-step testing from the public health department and not switch to a monkeypox specific RT-PCR that would be homegrown instead because we have not yet figured out how to adequately address this. CDC will update published primer and um, probe information soon so that this can be avoided. So I'm going to go over the treatment information for healthcare professionals for monkeypox. Most of the current infections are self-limited and resolved with supportive care because they are caused by clade 2 of the monkeypox virus, which causes less severe disease. However, the CDC has published some treatment considerations for monkeypox. The following people should be considered in consultation with the CDC. These are people with severe disease such as hemorrhagic disease, confluent lesions, sepsis or encephalitis, and those with risk factors for severe disease such as immunocompromise, pediatric populations less than age eight, pregnant or breastfeeding women, people with exfoliative skin conditions, or people with complications such as bronchopneumonia or gastroenteritis and diarrhea. There is also a more nebulous category, which is persons with monkeypox lesions in aberrant locations, such as accidental implantation in the eyes or other anatomic areas of special hazards, such as genitals or anus the bulk of our patients actually fall into the la that last category. The only treatment that is being widely used right now for monkeypox is Ticoviramat, also known as TPOX. So TPOX was approved by the FDA in 2018 for treatment of smallpox, but not for monkeypox under what's called the animal rule, which I will explain in a little bit. And it is able to be used for patients over three kilograms of weight. Um, oral and IV formulations are both available. The animal rule basically implies that human studies, human efficacy studies are not ethical and field trials are not feasible. And this was true for smallpox, which is why it was approved for smallpox. But monkeypox disease did not meet the criteria for animal rule because at the time of this approval, there were countries in Africa where this disease was endemic and clinical trials could have been conducted. Also, the current presentations that we're seeing with the disease are very different from what was seen in endemic countries, which is why it has been studied more rigorously now. So the drug is only available under expanded access IND through the CDC. The other options are Cidofovir, which is IV only, and Brin Cidofovir and Vaccinia immunoglobulin, both of which are only available through the CDC. So the CDC, um, has this expanded access IND protocol for obtaining TPOX. And at the beginning, it was actually quite detailed and it was quite onerous because a lot of forms were required. However, since then, the CDC has taken significant uh, steps to make this as simple and as um, uncomplicated for the frontline practitioner as possible. The CDC EAIND provides an umbrella regulatory coverage. So Clinicians and facilities don't need to have their own internal IRB for this investigational new drug protocol. And the forms that you see on the right-hand side of the slide, previously when we started doing this in July, every one of these forms was required. So we needed the consent, the patient intake, the FDA form, the adverse events, the patient diary, the outcomes, the photos, all of them. Currently, it is much more simple. All you need is the informed consent and the patient intake form per patient. The FDA form 1572, only one of this form is needed one time from one facility. So one for each facility. And then if there are any serious adverse events, then you must report them. No follow-up is mandatory and all other forms are deemed optional at this time. So this is the consent process by the CDC. You can get consent from the patient or the parent of the patient with the signature of the person obtaining the consent. They also make an allowance for two treating physicians to evaluate and decide if treatment is a good 
uh, is recommended for this patient if informed consent is not possible. They also have a shortened version of the consent form with a written summary which can be used. So I'm going to go into a little bit about how we have simplified this process, keeping in, in mind the IP tenets about minimizing exposure to our healthcare workers. So for our emergency departments, urgent cares and clinics where these patients were mainly presenting, we initially had a pox on call physician available 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Sunday to answer urgent questions, differential diagnosis, and consider empiric T-pox prescriptions. We have since developed a monkeypox smart set. And if you open the smart set, it gives you both the face-to-face -face visit note and the telehealth visit note. It gives you the diagnosis and it easily links you to all the tests, including the monkeypox virus by PCR test, as well as other STIs, which the clinician might want to test for. The template of the progress note collects all the information that might be deemed necessary, such as the date of onset of symptoms, the last unprotected sex, the type of sex habits, is there any evidence of exchange sex, et cetera. Even with the previous workflow, though, we were seeing a significant blockage in our clinic rooms. So every time a patient came in face to face, the room would need to be cleaned by environmental services. It would need to be aired out for one hour because our clinic rooms are not negative air. So we created an alternate workflow to decompress our emergency room and our urgent care sites. Currently, monkeypox drive-through testing is available through Santa Clara County. Um, when a patient calls with concerns for monkeypox, appointment can be scheduled by phone or clinic RN in the drive-through site. The only two tests that are available through the drive-through are COVID testing and monkeypox testing. So when a patient drives up to the site, they're asked if they're there for COVID testing or other testing. And if they say they're here for other testing, that means it's monkeypox and they get a green placard to their car. They drive through a tent, which is a 20 by 20 foot drive through tent, where inside the tent, they are greeted by an RN who does an evaluation. A part of the RN evaluation is collecting the symptom onset and other pertinent um, demographic features and epidemiological risk factors. But the patients are also given this little cartoon of a person so that they can mark out where their most extensive lesions are. Um, it saves them the embarrassment of having to voice it. So we find this very convenient for the patients. And if they say the bulk of their lesions are below the level of their waist, then they're given a gown to change into and they're taken to a privacy screen area within the tent where there's hard surfaced furniture available for the patient to be evaluated, tested, and then the furniture can be easily wiped down and used for the next patient. At the time of the discharge from the testing site, they're given isolation instructions on what to do until the test results come back. They're also given additional uh, testing and clinic appointment information in case this test is negative. So it basically says if your monkeypox test is negative, then and you and you still are experiencing symptoms, here's a number you can call or here's where you can go to get additional STI testing. So this is an example of our mass vaccination site where we do um, where we do our monkeypox and COVID immunizations. And the same staff that work in this site also operate these drive-through tents and we're able to pivot between the vaccination site and the drive-through site quite easily. Um, the picture on the right top is the drive-through tents that are set up for monkeypox and COVID testing. Um, on the bottom left, you see the tent interior and the privacy screened area. And then the bottom right is the is the inside of the privacy screened area. It's completely private. All the furniture is hard surface, so it's easy to clean. Once the patient's test results come back and our testing turnaround time currently is two to three days, the results are sent to the patient both by email as well as by My Health Online, which is the Epic portal. But we make sure a nurse calls them. And in, the, in this very long, set of instructions, what we cover is the test result and the interpretation. What does it mean if your test is indeterminate? It might mean that you need to get retested. It tells them how to isolate themselves and how to take care of their family members. It tells them how long to isolate. It tells them how they can provide themselves um, self-care and symptomatic relief, like what lozenges to use, topical lidocaine, oat milk soaks, etc. And it tells them what the treatment indications are and how to schedule an appointment to be evaluated for treatment. In addition, the fact that a nurse calls them and asks them if they have any treatment indications or if they would like to be evaluated for treatment keeps them from showing up willy-nilly to any random site because they're in pain. 
most of the appointments are telehealth appointments. In the telehealth appointments, we um, include um, software for them to be able to upload their pictures so that we can have a record of how their, how their lesions are doing. And in the progress note, as I mentioned pr previously, we've also built in the indications for TPOX um, in a drop list. So the screenshot for that is in the bottom left-hand side, age less than eight, severe disease with complications, pharyngeal pain and difficulty swallowing, proctitis or difficulty with urination, intractable pain, immunocompromised or exfoliative skin conditions or other. We include if the patient has been consented and if the benefits and risks were discussed. We have some vanishing tips so that providers don't have to memorize what the adverse events are and they can just read off headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, hypoglycemia with repaglinide, et cetera. And then these little things that you see jump to TPOX consent, jump to TPOX intake form A. These are hyperlinks. So if the provider clicks on these, it will launch the appropriate forms. Some of the data will pre-populate in these forms that CDC wants, and that they can be stored as communications and then printed out and sent to the CDC. So we make it as easy as possible for this appointment to be completed in a timely manner and for all these forms to be completed. Before I move on to management of the exposed, um, I would like to say that, uh, you know, in the state of California, currently about 1900 doses of oral TPOX have been dispensed and we've had about 4,000 cases. So it seems like about 50% or less of patients are being treated. But in our facility, that percentage is much greater, uh, partly because we are also getting referrals from other locations for patients who qualify for treatment. So we're one of the three um, places in Santa Clara County where TPOX is being um, administered to patients. Moving on to management of the exposed, um, who needs to be monitored for exposure? Anyone with exposure to monkeypox should be monitored for signs and symptoms of monkeypox for 21 days. And in the sign and symptom evaluation, a thorough skin, oral, and genital examination in good lighting must be performed. So this can be done by self-monitoring in isolation if the person is at home. Public health can consider monitoring for high-risk contacts, but if the patient is admitted, healthcare worker monitoring is concerned. The healthcare workers are recommended in our facility to wear masks, gloves, and eye protection preferably for all skin evaluations, especially if they're going to be handling mucous membranes or the genital area, and hand hygiene is mandatory before and after. In terms of activity restrictions, persons who are asymptomatic and don't have any lesions are not restricted from any activities and don't have to quarantine. However, they should avoid high transmission settings, and certain activities might be restricted if it poses risks to additional people who are high risk, such as immunocompromised persons or young children in daycare. Um, when a patient who is exposed is admitted to your facility, you do not have to isolate them, but you must monitor them for 21 days. And if a patient is unable to verbalize signs and symptoms or cannot comply with this monitoring, then you can consider isolation for that 21-day period. If a rash develops in that 21-day period, Immediate contact and airborne isolation must be put into place until the patient is evaluated, the patient is tested, and the test is negative. If nonspecific symptoms develop, the isolation is extended for five days, even if this goes beyond the 21-day period, to see if additional rashes or additional symptoms develop. You can consult with the public health department, and you can end it early if there is an alternate explanation for the symptoms. Um, when you create protocols for your hospitals, please highlight the importance of nursing skin assessment, which is critical to identifying these patients. Consider mandatory gloving for skin assessments and emphasize hand hygiene. So this is our occupational risk assessment chart, which is modified from the CDC only to address healthcare workers. The people with the, the healthcare workers who have higher degree of exposure are the ones that we monitor with active surveillance for 21 days for whom post-exposure prophylaxis with vaccination is highly recommended. What constitutes a high-risk exposure? It's unprotected contact with the broken skin of the exposed individuals or mucous membrane of the exposed individual and the skin and body fluids of the person with monkeypox or being in a patient's room within six feet for medical procedures that are aerosol generating without having an N95 or higher respirator 
and eye protection. That's what's a high risk high risk exposure. Intermediate risk exposures in our facility are managed by self-monitoring for symptoms for 21 days and administration of um, vaccination is a risk versus benefit discussion. What this constitutes is being within six feet for a cumulative time of three hours or more of an unmasked patient while the exposed individual is also unmasked or unprotected contact between an exposed individual's intact skin with the skin lesions or bodily fluids or linens of the monkeypox patient while not wearing a gown. Lower risk exposures are managed with self-monitoring, but post-exposure prophylaxis is not recommended. This is basically entry into the contaminated room without wearing full PPE in the absence of an intermediate or a higher risk exposure. If a person enters with all recommended PPE and comes out without any breach in their PPE, they are considered not exposed. I will end with a couple of slides on vaccination. So there are two vaccines approved for monkeypox. Um, the first is Genios, which is a non-replicating vaccine approved for both subcutaneous and intradermal route. And the second is ACAM 2000, which is a live replicating vaccine. The live replicating vaccine is not currently used very widely because there have been some cases of myocarditis, especially when used in young military recruits. The vaccine can be given up to within four days post-exposure ideally, but can be given up to 14 days post-exposure for prevention of severe disease. For pre-exposure prophylaxis, the CDC recommends that the following individuals be considered for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Research or clinical lab personnel who deal with these viruses, healthcare workers who take care of these patients, and healthcare workers who administer the ACAM 2000 vaccine. These vaccines produce a scarification, which is also seen with the smallpox vaccination, pictured in the right top. So as of, um, as of yesterday, the vaccination strategies used in 2022 US monkeypox outbreak recommended the vaccine for post-exposure prophylaxis and expanded post-exposure prophylaxis for people who are known contacts for someone with monkeypox via case investigation, as well as people who are aware that a recent sexual partner within the last 14 days were diagnosed with monkeypox and certain individuals who might have been involved in sex with multiple partners, sex at a commercial venue or an event, or in a defined geographic area where monkeypox transmission is known to be occurring. Pre-exposure prophylaxis was recommended only for certain high-risk groups. Until yesterday in our area, the only people who were eligible for um, pre-exposure prophylaxis were men uh, who had sex with men, um, including trans people, um, who had who had high risk sexual contacts. Currently, as of today, this eligibility criteria has been expanded. So it includes men or trans people who have sex with men, including gay or bisexual men and gender diverse people. But it also includes sex workers and people who engage in survival sex or exchange sex, regardless of orientation or identity. It includes people who have close contact with someone with suspected or confirmed monkeypox, and as well as people who've had close contact with venues or events where transmission is known to be occurring. They also have just started allowing healthcare worker vaccination at this time. So healthcare workers who are high risk for exposure, including those who work in SDI clinics, ID clinics, emergency departments, and urgent care clinics are now eligible in my county for vaccination. But we are emphasizing that PPE protects, and it is our most important tool in preventing transmission to healthcare workers. We are prioritizing our vaccine for patients at this time, and we will be allowing certain healthcare workers because this guidance has just been issued. I believe that is my last slide. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity uh, to speak to all of you in this collaboration between Shay and APIC. These are my acknowledgments, and I am ready for any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, and really great information here. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and throw them in the Q&A uh, box here, and we can go ahead and take them up. We've got a couple here lined up, and one of them is, uh, what is the justification for having two different waste management uh, according to the CLAD? Uh, is, isn't is that feasible in the routine case management? Yeah, I, I can start with with that and then Sabria can can jump in. 
Um, so one of the, the clades is, is a lot more aggressive and requires a lot more care than the other. So we do have to, to treat the waste a little bit more differently as well. And if you haven't worked this out with your facility, again, going back to what the poll at the beginning, I know some people said they had not seen monkeypox cases yet. Something that um, I know a lot of people have done already is to, I know we're not, not we're seeing a lot more one of one clade, but what if you don't know? And how are you doing um, almost like a mini risk assessment on patients coming in to understand if they have that travel history and to really understand if, if they have gone to certain areas that may be more endemic to um, the clade that would require category A waste management. So really looking at how you're doing a risk stratification of patients to make sure that if you did have to do a category A waste management that you're um, that you have a plan for that and that you um, can talk to infection prevention or your epidemiology team to make sure that you can do that kind of a risk assessment. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, and maybe I'm, I'm gonna make it a little bit broader, is uh, the question was specific around, uh, can we get monkeypox from massage beds? But you know, can you talk about some of the broader concerns, like if you're at the gym or trying on clothes, you know, there's been lots of questions around you know, what's, what's required in terms of contact time and, and nature in order to, uh, to contract monkeypox? Supri, do you want that one? Yeah, I'll try. So, um, you know, that's a million dollar question. And in many of the, um, you know, Shea uh, threads, I've seen this asked as to, do we know how long the virus can persist on devices? Do we know how long the virus can persist on surfaces? And what about clothing? So I would generally say that viral persistence is greater in uh, linens and fabrics and clothing more than it is on harder surfaces. Um, the risk of exposure is relatively low if your skin is unbroken. And, you know, if hand hygiene is performed pretty rigorously when before and after touching many different things. So I would say that just universal precautions, standard universal precautions will go a long way. Um, I do think that most places are still keeping some, um, maintaining some d degree of vigilance in terms of clothing, uh, tryouts, et cetera, due to COVID. So um, at least in California, I've noticed that people, you know, if a item, a garment has been tried on, then it's kept again to in a separate area to dry for several days before it's returned to the racks. So that might be a good practice, but I would say the bulk of these patients that we're seeing, it's not transient contact. It's not contact because they, you know, handled a doorknob. It's because they had close, intimate contact. So I think we're, you're much more likely to get it from close intimate contact than from like trivial, trivial things like touching a doorknob. Great. That's super helpful. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, the questions are piling in here. So uh, next question is, uh, do they need to be in a negative pressure room? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so I, I kind of covered that, but the CDC says there's no special air handling required. So that means that they do not need to be in a negative air pressure room or an AIIR as we call it an airborne infectious isolation room. What it does say on the CDC website though, is if you're doing an aerosolizing procedure that you do need to have them in an airborne infectious isolation room or negative pressure. So however you want to manage that, whether you prioritize going into a negative pressure room just in case, if you have rooms enough for that, or if you want to try and move them, if you go into an um, aerosolizing procedure, um, depending on your volume of, of monkeypox cases. But the CDC website says for routine care, you do not need an airborne isolation room and or negative uh, pressure unless you're doing an aerosolizing procedure. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I do see the comment that Cal OSHA states it's airborne and I work in California. So yes, it does. It does say that it's airborne. So if a patient is admitted, we try for a negative pressure room, but it depends upon the availability. And again, we prioritize the negative pressure rooms for those who are undergoing aerosol generating procedures. The same thing that we did for COVID essentially. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, next question up is, how would you uh, risk assess staff who worked while symptomatic with lesions and had direct patient contact? We've all heard kind of uh, certainly this happening or at least uh, anecdotally it happening. Uh, let's see, who, Joe, you want to take tackle that one first? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, in, in infection prevention, we would um, work with occupational health on this and they, they would do a lot of this investigation. I, I know this has happened before and um, some of the questions that you would want to ask first are where are the lesions? Um, it, you know, a lot of the time the lesions are in a place that would have been covered by clothing. Um, so they would have been contained and so the risk level would be very low. So those are some of the questions that you would initially ask if they had lesions on the palms of their hands, obviously that would be a lot more high risk than if they had lesions that were under their clothes. So um, that is some of what that risk assessment would look like. So it would be different for every single employee that, that you would come across. It, it would have to be case by case. Yeah, yeah I'll add to that. Um, so a couple, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Sarah Hessler from Bay State presented at the Shea Town Halls and she shared an experience where exactly this happened in her organization. And she shared the risk assessment risk assessment and was exactly what Jill said. So they had a healthcare worker who had worked um, accidentally without knowing that they had monkeypox and they had to do a large scale risk assessment. And, you know, as it turned out, the lesions were in areas of the body that were not in contact with the patients. And this healthcare worker had been diligent about hand hygiene and they had been diligent about wearing gloves. And so, you know, you go step by step into what you know about the transmission. And hopefully by that risk assessment, you don't have a large um, number of patients who have had a high risk exposure, just a small amount. And then post exposure prophylaxis is recommended for people who might have had that kind of contact. Thank you. Uh, next question up is if the lesions are covered in, in the healing process, is the person still contagious? Super, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So um, the lesions that are not yet fully scabbed and the scab has not yet separated are contagious. Um, however, the CDC has issued some guidance, um, CDC and our local public health authorities, about how individuals whose lesions can be covered and are mostly in areas that can be covered and are kind of in the process of healing can resume some activities without being completely isolated. So the recommendations for um, allowing them to step out or do certain activities includes that they must avoid high-risk settings, that they must always use a private bathroom, that they must clean that bathroom after use, and they're allowed to go back to work if their work is the type that cannot be done remotely, but also does not involve exposure to high-risk individuals. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to take uh, linens and laundry here because there was a couple questions I want to throw them together. So one of them is many hospitals send their laundry to outside facilities for processing. Are there specific guidelines coming out of these facilities with regard to manually sorting of them? Uh, and then there was a second question regarding uh, uh, hospital curtains, uh, linen and curtains, and, and other needs around how to address those as well. So, Jill, do you want to take a first cut at both of those? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's interesting because we we had these same conversations because it, it the guidelines say don't be too rough with your linens and don't toss all around your linens. But if you've ever visited one of these um, factories where they do all of the linens that we send our hospitals to, the first thing they do is dump all the linens out. And, and that's exactly what happens there. So uh, this also requires you to have conversations with your linen companies and with those folks that are handling all of your linens to make sure that everybody is on the same page with how you're going to be handling the linens, how it's going to be coming to them. So this isn't something that you can just do in a vacuum and say, we're just going to put it all together and the soiled linen, and then we're going to send it to you and be sure that you just handle all of our linen carefully now because it might have monkeypox linen inside of it. So it, it is a, a partnership and a collaboration with your linen companies and ABS if, if they are the ones that are handling the linen too. So um, I, that's kind of part one. It's not really a, a end all be all answer for all linen. It does have to be something that you work with your linen company on. As far as curtains, I don't think that we can say blanket statement, everybody needs to change their curtains every single time for every monkeypox PUI. Uh, because a lot of times, um, depending on where you are and how quickly your testing comes back, the, the test may not even come back before somebody leaves your ED. A lot of uh, the folks that we're seeing aren't being admitted. They're, they're, not, um, they're coming into the EDs, so they're getting tested, they're going home. Um, that's gonna be a lot of, of curtain changes for your uh, emergency departments. 
um, if they are getting admitted and they are positive, you'll want to work, work with your IP departments if you're not already IP or review your current policies and see what you want to do and make sure that everybody's on the same page with, are we changing them? If we are, let's make sure it happens all the time. Um, but let's make sure that everybody knows what is supposed to be happening and is it only for positives or is it for PUIs? Um, too, because some of these tests are taking a week or more to come back, and they're already going to be, you know, discharged before we even get those test results back. And many, many of them are just coming through the ED and then, um, and then going going home. So we won't ever know if they were positive or not until weeks later. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. I think we're almost out of time. Looks like there's even uh, lots of interest in linen. So uh, you know, for future research, <laughs> as they say. But again, uh, thank you all so much for taking time out. Hope that this was a uh, very useful webinar. And thanks again to our partner, Shay, uh, for again, bringing this together. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you to our speakers so much for a great session. Take care, all.